Chapter the Sixth, Sections Four and Five of The Secret Places of the Heart. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Danny Hogger. The Secret Places of the Heart by H. G. Wells. Chapter the Sixth, Section Four. The sudden prospect which now opened out before Sir Richmond of talking about history and such like topics with a charming companion for perhaps two whole days instead of going on with this tiresome, shame-faced, egotistical business of self-examination was so attractive to him that it took immediate possession of his mind, to the entire exclusion and disregard of Dr. Martineau's possible objections to any such modification of their original program. When they arrived in Salisbury, the doctor did make some slight effort to suggest a different hotel from that in which the two ladies had engaged their rooms, but on the spur of the moment and in their presence he could produce no sufficient reason for refusing the accommodation the old George had ready for him. He was reduced to a vague, we don't want to inflict ourselves. He could not get Sir Richmond aside for any adequate expression of his feelings about Miss Safert before the four of them were seated together at tea amidst the medieval modernity of the old George smoking room. And only then did he begin to realize the depth and extent of the engagements to which Sir Richmond had committed himself. I was suggesting that we run back to Avebury tomorrow, said Sir Richmond. These ladies were nearly missing it. The thing took the doctor's breath away. For the moment he could say nothing. He stared over his teacup dour-faced. An objection formulated itself very slowly. But that Dicky, he whispered. His whisper went unnoted. Sir Richmond was talking of the completeness of Salisbury. From the beginning, it had been a cathedral city. It was essentially and purely that. The church, at its best, in the full tide of its medieval ascendancy, had called it into being. He was making some extremely loose and inaccurate generalizations about the buildings and ruins each age had left for posterity, and Miss Grammont was countering with equally unsatisfactory qualifications. Our age will leave the ruins of hotels, said Sir Richmond, railway arches and hotels. Baths and aqueducts, Miss Grammont compared. Rome of the Empire comes nearest to it. As soon as tea was over, Dr. Martineau realized they meant to walk round and about Salisbury. He foresaw that walk with the utmost clearness. In front, and keeping just a little beyond the range of his intervention, Sir Richmond would go with Miss Grammont. He himself and Miss Seyfert would bring up the rear. If I do, he muttered, I'll be damned. An unusually strong expression for him. You said, asked Miss Seyfert, that I have some writing to do before the post goes, said the doctor brightly. Oh, and come and see the cathedral, cried Sir Richmond with ill-concealed dismay. He was, if one may put it in such a fashion, not looking at Miss Seyfert in the directest fashion when he said this. I'm afraid, the doctor said maliciously, impossible with the unspoken addition of, you try her for a bit. Miss Grammont stood up. Everybody stood up. We can go first to look for shop, she said. There's those things you want to buy, Belinda, a fountain pen and the little books. We can all go together as far as that. And while you are shopping, if you wouldn't mind getting one or two things for me. It became clear to Dr. Martineau that Sir Richmond was to be let off Belinda. It seemed abominably unjust. And it was also clear to him that he must keep closely to his own room where he might find Miss Seifert drifting back alone to the hotel and eager to resume with him. Well, a quiet time in his room would not be disagreeable. He could think over his notes. But in reality, he thought over nothing but the little speeches he would presently make to Sir Richmond about the unwarrantable, the absolutely unwarrantable alterations that were being made without his consent in their common program. For a long time, Sir Richmond had met no one so interesting and amusing as this frank-minded young woman from America. Young woman was how he thought of her. She didn't correspond to anything so prim and restrained and extensively reserved and withheld as a young lady. And though he judged her no older than five and twenty, the word girl, with its associations of virginal ignorances, invisible perda, and trite ideas newly discovered, seemed even less appropriate for her than the word boy. She had an air of having in some obscure way graduated in life, as if so far she had lived each several year of her existence in a distinctive and conclusive manner, with the utmost mental profit and no particular tarnish or injury. He could talk with her as if he talked with a man like himself, but with a zest no man could give. 
it was evident that the good things she had said at first came as the natural expression of a broad stream of alert thought. They were no mere display specimens from one of those jackdaw collections of bright things so many clever women waste their wits in accumulating. She was not talking for effect at all. She was talking because she was tremendously interested in her discovery of the spectacle of history and delighted to find another person as possessed as she was. Belinda, having been conducted to her shops, the two made their way through the bright evening sunlight to the compact gracefulness of the cathedral. A glimpse through a wrought iron gate of a delightful garden of spring flowers, elysium, abriesia, snow upon the mountains, daffodils, narcissus, and the like, held them for a time, and then they came out upon the level, grassy space surrounded by the little ripe old houses on which the cathedral stands. They stood for some moments surveying it. It's a perfect little lady of a cathedral, said Sir Richmond, but why, I wonder, did we build it? Your memory ought to be better than mine, she said, with her half-closed eyes blinking up at the sunlit spire, sharp against the blue. I've been away for so long over there that I forget altogether. Why did we build it? She had fallen in quite early with this freak of speaking and thinking as if he and she were all mankind. It was as if her mind had been prepared for it by her own eager exploration in Europe. My friend, the philosopher, he had said, will not have it that we are really the individuals we think we are. You must talk to him. He is a very curious and subtle thinker. We are just thoughts in the mind of the race, he says, passing thoughts. We are, what does he call it? Man on his planet, taking control of life. Man and woman, she had amended. But just as man on his planet, taking control of life, had failed altogether to remember why the ditch at Avebury was on the inside instead of the outside of the vallum, so now Miss Grammont and Sir Richmond found very great difficulty in recalling why they had built Salisbury Cathedral. We built temples by habit and tradition, said Sir Richmond, but the impulse was losing its force. She looked up at the spire and then at him with a faintly quizzical expression, but he had had his reply ready. We were beginning to feel our power over matter. We were already very clever engineers. What interested us here wasn't the old religion anymore. We wanted to exercise and display our power over stone. We made it into reeds and branches. We squirted it up in all these spires and pinnacles. The priest and his altar were just an excuse. Do you think people ever feared and worshipped in this, this artist's lark as they did in Stonehenge? I certainly do not remember that I ever worshipped here, she said. Sir Richmond was in love with the idea. The spirit of the Gothic cathedrals, he said, is the spirit of the skyscrapers. It is architecture in a mood of flaming ambition. The Freemasons on the building could hardly refrain from jeering at the little priest they had left down below there, performing antiquated puerile mysteries at his altar. He was just their excuse for doing it all. Skyscrapers, she conceded, an early display of the skyscraper spirit. You are doing your best to make me feel thoroughly at home. You are more at home here still than in that new country of ours over the Atlantic. But it seems to me now that I do begin to remember building this cathedral and all the other cathedrals we built in Europe. It was the fun of building made us do it. Hmm, she said. And my skyscrapers? Still the fun of building. That is the thing I envy most about America. It's still large enough, mentally and materially, to build all sorts of things. Over here, the sites are frightfully crowded. And what do you think we are building now? And what do you think you are building over here? What are we building now? I believe we have almost grown up. I believe it is time we began to build in earnest, for good. But are we building anything at all? A new world. Show it to me, she said. We are still only at the foundation, said Sir Richmond. Nothing shows us yet. I wish I could believe they were foundations, but can you doubt we are scrapping the old? It was too late in the afternoon to go into the cathedral, so they strolled to and fro round and about the west end and along the path under the trees towards the river, exchanging their ideas very frankly and freely about the things that had recently happened to the world and what they thought they ought to be doing in it. End of section 4 Section 5 after dinner, our four tourists sat late and talked in a corner of the smoking room. The two ladies had vanished hastily at the first dinner gong and reappeared at the second, mysteriously and pleasantly changed from tweedy pedestrians to indoor company. They were quietly but definitely dressed. Pretty alterations had happened to their coiffure. 
A silver band and deep red stones lit the dusk of Miss Grammont's hair, and a necklace of the same colorings kept the peace between her jolly sunburnt cheek and her soft, untanned neck. It was evident that her recent uniform had included a collar of great severity. Miss Seifert had revealed a plump forearm and proclaimed it with a clash of bangles. Dr. Martineau thought her evening throat much too confidential. The conversation drifted from topic to topic. It had none of the steady continuity of Sir Richmond's dialogue with Miss Grammont. Miss Seifert's methods were too discursive and exclamatory. She broke every thread that appeared. The old George at Salisbury is really old. It shows it, and Miss Seifert laced the entire evening with her recognition of the fact. Just look at that old beam, she would cry suddenly. To think it was exactly where it is before there was a cabot in America. Miss Grammont let her companion pull the talk about as she chose. After the animation of the afternoon, a sort of lazy contentment had taken possession of the younger lady. She sat deep in a basket chair and spoke now and then. Miss Seifert gave her impressions of France and Italy. She talked of the cabmen of Naples and the beggars of Amalfi. A propos of beggars, Miss Grammont from the depths of her chair threw out the statement that Italy was frightfully overpopulated. In some parts of Italy, it is like mites on a cheese. Nobody seems to be living. Everyone is too busy keeping alive. Poor old women carrying loads big enough for mules, said Miss Seifert. Little children working like slaves, said Miss Grammont. And everybody's begging, even the people at work by the roadside, who ought to be getting wages. Sufficient begging from foreigners is just a sport in Italy, said Sir Richmond. It doesn't imply want. But I agree that a large part of Italy is frightfully overpopulated. The whole world is, don't you think so, Martineau? Well, yes, for its present social organization. For any social organization, said Sir Richmond. I've no doubt of it, said Miss Seifert and added amazingly, I'm out for birth control all the time. A brief but active pause ensued. Dr. Martineau, in a state of sudden distress, attempted to drink out of a cold and empty coffee cup. The world swarms with cramped and undeveloped lives, said Sir Richmond, which amount to nothing, which do not even represent happiness, and which help to use up the resources, the fuel and surplus energy of the world. I suppose they have a sort of liking for their lives, Miss Grammont reflected. Does that matter? They do nothing to carry life on. They are just vain repetitions, imperfect, dreary, blurred repetitions of one common life. All that they feel has been felt. All that they do has been done better before. Because they are crowded and hurried and underfed and undereducated, and as for liking their lives, they need never have had the chance. How many people are there in the world? She asked abruptly. I don't know. 1,200, 1,500 million, perhaps? And in your world? I'd have 250 millions, let us say, at most. It would be quite enough for this little planet, for a time at any rate. Don't you think so, Doctor? I don't know, said Dr. Martineau. Oddly enough, I have never thought about the question before, at least not from this angle. But could you pick out 250 million aristocrats, began Miss Grammont. My native instinctive democracy need not be outraged, said Sir Richmond. Any 250 million would do. They'd be able to develop fully, all of them. As things are, only a minority can do that. The rest never get a chance. That's what I always say, said Miss Seifert. A new age, said Dr. Martineau, a new world. We may be coming to such a stage when population as much as fuel will be under a world control. If one thing, why not the other? I admit that the movement of thought is away from haphazard towards control. I'm for control all the time, Miss Seifert interjected, following up her previous success. I admit, the doctor began his broken sentence again with marked patience, that the movement of thought is away from haphazard towards control in things generally, but is the movement of events. The eternal problem of man, said Sir Richmond, can our wills prevail? There came a little pause. Miss Grammont smiled an enquiry at Miss Seifert. If you are, said Belinda. I wish I could imagine your world, said Miss Grammont, rising. Of 250 millions of fully developed human beings with room to live and breathe in and no need for wars. Will they live in palaces? Will they all be healthy? Machines will wait on them. No, I can't imagine it. Perhaps I shall dream of it. My dreaming self may be cleverer. She held out her hand to Sir Richmond. Just for a moment, they stood hand in hand appreciatively. Well, said Dr. Martineau, as the door closed behind the two Americans, this is a curious encounter.
That young woman has brains, said Sir Richmond, standing before the fireplace. There was no doubt whatever which young woman he meant, but Dr. Martineau grunted. I don't like the American type, the doctor pronounced judicially. I do, Sir Richmond countered. The doctor thought for a moment or so. You were committed to the project of visiting Avebury, he said. They ought to see Avebury, said Sir Richmond. Hmm, said the doctor, ostentatiously amused by his thoughts and staring at the fire. Birth control. I never did. Sir Richmond smiled down the top of the doctor's head and said nothing. I think, said the doctor and paused, I shall leave this Avebury expedition to you. We can be back in the early afternoon, said Sir Richmond, to give them a chance of seeing the cathedral. The chapter house here is not one to miss. And then I suppose we shall go on? As you please, said Sir Richmond insincerely. I must confess that four people make the car at any rate seem tremendously overpopulated. And to tell the truth, I do not find this encounter so amusing as you seem to do. I shall not be sorry when we have waved goodbye to those young ladies and resume our interrupted conversation. Sir Richmond considered something mulish in the doctor's averted face. I find Miss Grammont an extremely interesting and stimulating human being. Evidently, the doctor sighed, stood up, and found himself delivering one of the sentences he had engendered during his solitary meditations in his room before dinner. He surprised himself by the plainness of his speech. Let me be frank, he said, regarding Sir Richmond squarely. Considering the general situation of things and your position, I do not care very greatly for the part of an accessory to what may easily develop, as you know very well, into a very serious flirtation, an absurd, mischievous, irrelevant flirtation. You may not like the word. You may pretend it is a conversation, an ordinary intellectual conversation. That is not the word. Simply, that is not the word. You people eye one another. Flirtation. I give the affair its proper name. That is all. Merely that. When I think... But we will not discuss it now. Good night. Forgive me if I put before you, rather bluntly, my particular point of view. Sir Richmond found himself alone, with his eyebrows raised. End of Chapter the Sixth, Sections 4 and 5. Recording by Danny Hogger, Fullerton, California, www.dannyhogger.com.